But now I'm determined. I don't know about you, but if I fail or I lose, I'm coming. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 32 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sensei Rob Buckland. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. Don't forget our great products, like our strapless sparring boots that mean no more slipping on the floor. You can find more information about those and the rest of our stuff at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests on the podcast. And now, this week's review. This week's review comes in from Libby TKD. As a martial artist and instructor, I really enjoy your podcast. The guests are fantastic. The interviews are well done and coordinated. The questions get to some really interesting answers about why and how people started in the martial arts, and then finish up with what books and movies people enjoy. They also introduce us to fellow martial artists we may never otherwise hear about. Keep up the great work. Thank you for that, Libby TKD. Just email us at info at whistlekick.com, and we'll get you your free Whistlekick pack. And now to today's episode. On episode 32, we're joined by Sensei Rob Buckland, a karate practitioner and school owner who holds the honor of having earned a black belt under the late legend, Joe Lewis. Sensei Buckland opens up about his path through the martial arts and shares his stories in a very entertaining manner. And now, Sensei Buckland, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, it's great to be here, Jeremy. It's great to have you here. Now, I had a lot of fun with you and uh, some others when we went out to dinner, when I got a chance to meet you a few weeks ago and just knew that I had to get you on the show, knew I had to get you to tell some stories to the listeners. So I'm looking forward to this because I'm, I'm sure that we're going to have some stories, some good yeah. stories coming through. Um, I want to apologize in advance to the listeners because I may go silent quite a bit while I try and keep my laughter off of the recording. Uh, because that was one of the things that kept happening when we were at dinner is I, I was laughing my butt off. I was having a great time. So um, lo- looking forward to this. So, you know, there's there's a little bit about, you know, what listeners can expect. But why don't you tell us how you got into the martial arts? You know, where were you? How old were you? Why? All that good stuff. I was, uh, that's it. I was, believe it or not, after meeting me, you'll, 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 <laughs> you'll claim plaus- plausible deniability. but. I used to get beat up on the bus when I was a little kid. And uh, so I got picked on a, a lot in elementary school. And so when I was nine, my dad, who wasn't like a fighter himself, decided that uh, he was going to take me to karate school. And so that was it. I went and uh, I, <laughs> I just went and just fell in love with it. And the first thing I trained in was uh, Weichiru karate which is kind of a hard open out style and uh, not much for footwork, but I, I think by the time, by the time you were in trouble, they're on top of you anyway. So that, that, <laughs> that infighting stuff was perfect. But yeah, that's how it all started. It was, uh, you know, then it, it's, it's kind of a miracle that it happened because it's, uh, it was a low self-esteem kind of kid, you know, and um, it changed everything, man. Wow. So I, I want listeners to hone in just kind of on that piece there, because as we go through, I mean, I don't know a ton about you, but I know as we go through some of these stories, we're going to hear a transition, because if anyone has seen any of the photos, you know, that prior to listening to this show, you are not a small man. You are you are not someone that people would expect to be picked on. No. Um, some might say you're a big, scary guy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to meet you. I know that while I certainly don't want to mess with you, you're you're a good man. But the, I, I think we're going to hear a shift as we go on. So yeah. w- where did you grow up? I don't, I don't think we heard that part. Well, I was a GE brat. So that's that, that, uh, whatever General Electric moved your parents, you moved too, obviously. So it went from Syracuse, New York, to 
Manlius, New York, to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And where were you when you started Weichiru? I was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. My first instructor was a guy named Frank Gorman. I think he's in Florida now. Um, and then uh, my second instructor was a guy named uh, Joe Chartre, and he kind of broke off and did his own school. He was not, at that point, though, I was already sparring a lot, doing a lot of tournaments, and he, uh, that was one rule. I couldn't spar with the other students. <laughs> he said I, was, said I was a loose cannon. <laughs> what what does that mean? Um, I don't know. He said I was a wrecking ball. I remember <laughs> my black belt test. Joe Lewis, uh, my, uh, let's see. First of all, Frank Gorman turned around and hosted a Joe Lewis seminar at Birdie Mountain Ski Area there in Hancock, Massachusetts. And it turned out to be pretty well attended. Um, I learned something about him that day because when you host a seminar, usually you want to participate, especially with somebody like Joe Lewis. But Frank Frank knew better. He wore a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Joe turned around and sparred with everybody in the room. Everybody in the room. And uh, just cleaned the, cleaned the floor with some of the people that I just looked up to, the greatest martial artists ever. I, I actually achieved the split that day, uh, that night, um, at that seminar when I was warming up. And uh, uh, he taught my little newborn daughter uh, how to how to sidekick. So she was just standing and walking around, and she would wanders out there. And Mr. Lewis taught her how to sidekick. That was pretty cool. And um, but that uh, th- that thing turns. He, let's see. He said, "Why are you still a brown belt?" After he did some drills with me, and I had been a brown belt for a long time, and I think like I don't know four or five years, and uh, so. Uh, magically, I guess, because of Lewis's prodding, I, w- I was put up for black belt the next test. And when I, I just kind of, I didn't fight like they fought. They kind of were a little more static than me. Um, mm. I used the slide up side kick. I used that back fist. I used speed back kicks. And uh, where I just, they stopped the fight. Um, it was just supposed to be three minutes sparring, and they stopped it. That poor kid from New York, his glasses went flying. And, I'm not sure why he was wearing them, but <laughs> maybe they thought I wasn't going to do anything. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that that was it was kind of a, a wrecking ball type type reputation when I was coming up. So you had a you had a, a different approach to sparring than maybe the the kind of standard front stance or or side stance, you know, kind of. I, I guess what I, I what I'm imagining is what I see of Kyokushin fighting now. Yeah, really fast, but not as dynamic. Well, Joe Joe Lewis used to say uh, that I was an ugly fighter, and um, <laughs> the funny thing was is the reason that I started doing that is because I went into tournaments and I would I would win kata, but I would turn around and uh, I wasn't really a kata guy, but I and, but I would lose in the sparring when I was a middleweight. So I'm, I'm, I was trying to figure out the solution. And, of course, my instructor's telling me, well, that's because the tournaments are geared against the way through people. There's no grabbing. and it's You know, so, you know, you, you try to believe your instructor. But, so, of course, I'm reading Black Belt Magazine and seeing the great Joe Lewis doing, slot, uh, you know, slide-up side kicks, and I'm watching Wallace kick people in the head, and I wasn't being taught any of those things. Spinning back kicks were on TV with, David Carradine and Kung Fu, you know, yeah. so yeah. I, I started working on stuff that, uh, that wasn't being taught to me in class and doing it out of the magazine. And, um, then when I finally met Joe, it was, uh, I, I had already branched out to people who were willing to spar. Um, let's see, uh, UFC hadn't started yet. So this is the mid seventies. So I was, Man, I, I went out. I think I went to I went to the boxing club two days a week, and then there was a group of guys who didn't wear martial arts uniforms, and they did contact sparring. But you know, martial arts wise, they were kicking and punching, and they were mm-hmm. they were pretty brutal guys. So I would try to meet up with them, um, you know, two, three, four times a month, and uh, that's that's kind of how it all developed. It was kind of me making my own make it my own way. It wasn't really how, um, how we learned it in the school. Cause they, I remember hitting people with spinning back kicks in the school and they said, 
that's not in the style. And I, you know, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, mm. well, it's in my style. <laughs> yeah. so whatever works is in my toolbox. Right. Well, that's, I think there are a lot of us that grew up on both sides of that line. Uh, I've trained in schools that were very open and others that were not so. And I think you and I are similar. I think whatever works, whatever works for you, sure. what's going to work for you is certainly not going to work for me. And, um, you know, we're not big about talking about me on this show, but I'm a small guy. I'm five, seven, you know, you're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, yeah, you and I are going to spar pretty differently. Yeah, yeah, my 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 spar is a mess. <laughs> so that's a great intro to who you are, and and certainly there's the humor coming through. Uh, but we're all about stories here, as I said. So I know you got a ton. I'm going to ask you to pick one for now. Tell us your best martial arts story. Oh my god. You know, here, okay, here we go. So I have to, I have to do the little, uh, my, my business, my martial arts business mentor, Buzz Durkin told me that I need to keep it vanilla, not necessarily this interview, but just my presence because I'm kind of a wild card. Um, and so this story may not be vanilla, but I don't know. It was a big hit at karate college to the point where a guy turned around and brought 10 of his students and pulled me aside in the hall and said, would you tell that story again? <laughs> so uh, I could do that one or I could do a good Joe Lewis story. I'm not sure. Let's go. Well, you know what? We'll go with the, we'll go with the, the, the fan appreciation story. This is, uh, sure, I... <laughs> so this goes back. I was, uh, I was living in new Orleans, um, with my girlfriend and we were selling timeshare at, uh, a resort right off Canal Street there. And it was pretty clear that I didn't really fit in with this crowd too much. But uh, she was kind of a party girl, so she sure did. And, um, well, I don't remember what happened. I, th I think it was I flew home. And uh, so I came back to the Berkshires. I was living in Pittsfield then. And I flew, or, or had been, and I flew back there I went to a seminar at a school. One of the advanced Weichi uh, guys was was doing a seminar, so I went there. And I remember I had I had kicked cold high, and I tore my groin uh, oh. muscle pretty bad. So my attitude was uh, brutally inflamed. Anyway, so I turn around and I go to the hospital, and they give me uh, uh, whatever the pain medicine is, Vicodin. And I gave, they gave me this, this, uh, aluminum cane. So here I go. <laughs> I go home and come back on pain meds with a, uh, with a cane. Now I come rolling back in. It's Halloween. So, uh, I get there and, uh, I said, well, where I'm halfway there. And I call my boss. I said, uh, Hey, listen, we landed in Orlando. I should be there in another two hours. And he said, okay. He said, now listen, he goes, I don't want you to get upset, but, uh, we'll leave, we'll leave the girl's name out of this, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, she is out with Vinny. Now, Vinny was the resort Coke dealer. So, you know, in high pressure sales, these guys have their outlets, alcohol and drugs. And apparently she had teamed up with him. So they're off at the big Halloween bash, uh, that, um, MTV was putting on at the house of house of blues. And, uh, mm -hmm. Here I am landing at the airport. Well, everything's fine. I roll into roll into the bar where all the guys are hanging out, and uh, sure enough, Vinny's truck is right across the street parked. Now, if you know anything about New Orleans, you know that they got to clean the streets every. <laughs> they come by and they tell you if you're if you're uh, you know if you're if you're on the street when they're cleaning it. And this guy, he happened to have a whole bunch of parking tickets. I knew him, so I knew he had fourteen hundred bucks a ticket. So as I sat there and the the, uh, the rum and cokes mixed with the Vicodin, I thought, hmm, how am I going to make a good impression with Vinny tomorrow morning? <laughs> so what I did was I picked up the knife that they used to uh, slice the limes, and I stuck out and and, uh, and deflated all four of his tires and uh, snuck back in the bar without being seen. <laughs> 
And uh, the next morning, staggering down the street comes Vinny. Now, we're all standing ready for work, uh, waiting for the appointments to come in. And his uh, car is sitting there on its rims. And sure enough, the flatbed pulls up. And they're going to flatbed his truck. And I'm standing across the street. And I'm just laughing at him. Well, this guy, obviously, uh, not, <laughs> obviously not in his best state of mind. Uh, there's an outdoor cafe there. He reaches down and he grabs a fork and he comes running across the street after me with the fork. <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, am I going to take this guy out in the street? Or Because I know I'll get a charge. So I turn around and I go into the lobby of the resort. And this guy is desperately trying to stab me with this fork. <laughs> and I'm dead on blocking that thing every time it comes in. going, Drop the weapon. Drop the weapon. And after about four times, I said, hey, but I stuck my thumb in his eye and the first finger in his in his ear um, and uh, and proceeded to elbow him in the head until he fell down. And um, so it is to say, uh, I thought that I would walk away unscathed from that. But uh, the legend of Vinny the Fork turns out that they would rather have the coke dealer than the sales guy. <laughs> so they fired me. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, for defending myself. And uh, wow. they, they couldn't find any evidence of how the air got out of his tires because the security camera, somehow I must have ninja my way by the, by the truck <laughs> because, they, <laughs> because it didn't appear on the cameras. But anyway, that's the, uh, that's the legend of uh, Vinny the Fork. <laughs> so, so let that be a lesson to all of us not to mess with <laughs> Sensei Buckland's girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> because we'll uh, we'll lose the air on our tires, and then yeah. he'll beat us up when yeah. we attack him with a fork. It was pretty amazing. It <laughs> was a good story. Anyway, that's a great story. It is a good. Um, one. We'll come back. I mean, we'll get a chance to to throw some more stories in there, of course, and and I'm sure everybody wants to hear the Joe Lewis story that you mentioned. But let's take a step forward now. And the martial arts has been a big part of your life, certainly. Oh, yeah. I think it saved What's me. The, it saved you. <laughs> okay. So. Well, t- tell us about that. Well, you know how uh, we all have ups and downs and changes and things that go on in our lives, but the never-changing constant for me was just the martial arts training and whether it was, uh, I mean, I didn't have a lot of dough coming up, so I turned around and, I, I would go and uh, if I'd sleep in a car if I had to, so I didn't have to pay the hotel fee. Or if I went to a camp, I'd pay to be a day camper and sleep in my car and, you know, mm. bring cottage cheese and hard-boiled eggs and train with these guys. And so I would go to six or seven of these camps a year, plus go to, you know, day seminars all the time. And um, I don't know, it was something that no matter what was going on, but whether you're having uh, not so successes or actual failures where you turn around and rather becoming um, internally full focused and doing the, 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 the poor me thing. I could always fall back on martial arts always gave me, um, mm. you know, it's, it's not like a team sport. If you're on your, it's all about you. So if you, if you can make it, what's that? How's that saying go? If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> there yeah. you go. And that's the thing. And I was constantly, doing different styles and so it was constantly um you're you're constantly starting over and you know now as a as a a not not a kid you you realize that you know in order to be successful in anything change is the only uh never changing constant things are always changing and that got you used to not being ever being on top you're always doing something new you're always the student you never actually become the teacher because you're constantly learning. Whereas I run into a lot of black belts that think that, you know, they're, they're, they're who they are. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny. I, I love going to, a, go, go to a class where I don't know anything about what they're doing and just, uh, get in there and rock and roll, you know, um, <laughs> it, it kind of takes the ego out of it. And I think that's where your biggest chance to develop as a martial artist is. Yeah, I've been fortunate through Whistle Kick, through this show, to get the opportunity to meet a lot of great people like yourself, but also to train with with people that I wouldn't normally have the chance to train with. Right. And 
even though I don't get to train as often as I like to, which is kind of the irony of running a martial arts related business is that I don't get to do as much martial arts as I want. I'm sure that's what everybody thinks I do is I just train all day and, yeah. Yeah. you know, I've, I've got this deep staff that takes care of everything else and that's not <laughs> the case. But I get to train with people that do things so completely differently that it's revolutionized my perspective on a number of things. So I'm right there with you. I mean, it's how you get better. <laughs> Work on the stuff you don't know, right? Yeah, that's right. Where do you think you'd be if you hadn't gotten into martial arts? Oh, my God. Um, let's see. I don't know. I was kind of a kind of a crazy kid, so I think uh, my dad died when I was little, so um, but I was already in martial arts. I don't really remember life before martial arts, so I can't really tell you. I know I know the ASVAB test told me I should have been a uh, <laughs> I should have been a lawyer or an actor, and I am acting, so <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I just think I'm doing it better because of martial arts. Right on. So nobody's life is all sunshine and roses or however, whatever cliches you want to throw in there. I'd like you to think about a time in your life that things got rough, challenging, and how your martial arts experience and training allowed you to move through it. Mm. Wow. I didn't read this question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, wow. I don't know. You know, you have, like, tragic breakups with a girl or something, or, like, like my, when my dad died, or, like, even when Joe Lewis died. Um, rather than doing the poor me or drinking about it or doing, you know, whatever it is that people do, um, you get to, you could turn to the training. Like you take it out of, take it out on the weights, you know, sweat is, uh, sweat is fat crying. So, um, so <laughs> I always love doing footwork and hitting the bag and, um, and the double end bag. Cause boy, you can never make friends with that guy. And then, um, it was all. It was always the solution for every everything, every 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 time along the way. I mean, I tried other stuff. I tried to just do resistance training and weights and go running, and uh, but uh, there's nothing. There was nothing ever like like martial arts, and uh, it saved me. And in, in every every uh, every time something went wrong, I could turn to it, and it was there. And you're not the first person to express it that way. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had a lot of people on the show and quite a few of them have offered that as their answer. So thank you. So I know you've trained with a lot of people. You just told us you spent a lot of time training with anyone you could going to camps and whatnot. But who would you say the most influential person in your martial arts career has been? Mm. It would have to be Joe, Joe Lewis. I mean, at first he was just a martial arts icon and I just wanted to learn from him. And then well, it's usually you're in a parking lot or a hotel room or a restaurant. And then all of a sudden you realize this guy is your friend. And then he starts calling you every week. You know, when you're, or when you got something going on, you call him. And... So he was like not only like the master, the mentor, and the, the friend. He was all of those things, and uh, it seemed like uh, he had a similar sense of humor to me too. He used to, <laughs> we'd be somewhere, and um, they'd be going on, "No, Joe's going to act up or something like that." They go, "Buck them, you got a baby," said Joe. I was like, "Wow, okay." So you know, so and then what would happen? Well, me and Joe would get in trouble. So, <laughs> so it was perfect. And, and uh, we'd, he'd be at a camp somewhere. And he was, I didn't call him and tell him I was going. I would be living, I don't know, hundreds of miles away. And I would drive in, pull up, and walk into the room. And he'd be sitting there. He goes, oh, no. He goes, my <laughs> ethics coach is here. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so I think Joe Joe's probably the most significant. And the second one is uh, a guy named Jim Maloney. Jim Maloney brought, is a guy that brought karate to Canada. Um, he's a McNeck Indian. He, I mean, I call him dad. And uh, just when I was nine years old, he was doing some um, pressure point management system. Not so much Q-show, but uh, combatives using uh, targeting with pressure points. And this guy was brutal. And I was like nine or 10. No, I was 14. There you go. Jump flashback in here. Um, I was 14 and I was at this thing called Summerfest. It's a camp that, uh, George Matson puts on every year. And at that time it was at Endicott college. And I was just amazed by this guy. And he had this ponytail and just, he just popped around. He looked like the animals that the styles were named after. You know what I mean? When he was moving, I was like, damn, this is awesome. Well, he lit me up so much in that first seminar and then everybody else is limping away and leaving and, and he's doing another seminar in the afternoon. I showed up again. And then uh, the next day, he did two more, and I was at each one. And these guys are going, why do you keep going back? And he just, and, and I was like, I love this guy. This is just great. And then uh, it's funny because when I was living in New Orleans, he called me and he said, you need to move to Maine, son. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to move to Maine? And like two days later, a guy called me and offered me a job in me. Really? Yeah. So there's something spiritual about the guy, but there's also uh-huh. something amazing about the guy. And then he's got a heart of gold, man. He saved my butt a couple times. So I had some surgeries and stuff and he hooked me up with the, the dough to cover my insurance so that I could follow through with the surgeries. And yeah, he's a great guy. It's unbelievable. Uh-huh. His wife Bridget's an amazing boxer too. Can't find an uh-huh. opponent. See this girl. So you've had quite the Support structure. Oh my God! As yeah, a martial and, artist, people, great people to learn from and to lean on. Oh yeah, like you, I mean, even I can go go on other stuff. But Michael D. Pasquale Jr. has done so much for me, um, just with introductions and things like that, and just you know the instruction. And sometimes when Joe goes, you know, off the deep end, uh, you know, Michael would say, "Hey, you know." <laughs> so we were. Uh, it was good. It was good. I I I I, I draw most of my mentors come from come from martial arts. I mean, like Buzz Durkin is my business mentor. I wouldn't know. He, he, the guy, if you want a formula for success, you buy that guy's book. That's an, that's an amazing man right there. Martial arts mm. business man. I'm just making a, a note to look up his books because I don't think we've mentioned him on the show before. So, of course, oh, you should talk uh, to him. He's, uh, he's like a genius in martial arts business. And you know what? Oh, cool book's not in my car, otherwise I'd give you the title of it, but I think it's something about success. Just look it up. I read it. And my formula for those kind of books is you read it once, you read through and highlight, and then you read through the stuff that you highlighted. So yep. that's, that's my formula for those. And I haven't done the second two steps because I've been working on a product for the for my uh, my school there in Dover. So Okay. Well, um, like we do with all that kind of stuff, we're going to link to it on, on the page for this episode over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So I'll, I'll do that research and I'll put that up there and, of course, all the other things that we're going to talk about. Okay. So we hinted a little bit about your time with competition and how early on it seems like that really kind of set the path for you to venture and to, to start looking for other things and add pieces to your training and to your own personal style that you didn't have in Wichiru. Oh, yeah, was- but tell us... Tell us more about your time in competition. What did you like about it? Why did you do it? Where were you going? All that. Uh, well, <laughs> my friend, Sam Lagrateria, I didn't have a car. And he used to drive me on weekends, every weekend, to a different tournament. And this poor guy, he would see me win in forums, but all I wanted to do was win the fight. That's all I wanted to do. I couldn't do it. Couldn't. Have, I mean, I'd take some third places and stuff like that, but. I just couldn't do it. And um, so one day he said to me, we're on the way home from the <laughs> tournament, and I'm all pumped up because we're going to go to the next week to something else. And he stops, turns the car off, and he says, listen, he goes, I can't do this anymore. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I keep going to these things and watching you, watching you lose. He goes, it's terrible. He goes, I don't know how you can keep doing it. Well, I turned around, and I was like, okay. Uh, and so I, I guess later I got a car or I would get rides with people or something. But um, I was a I was a slow middleweight, but I was a fast heavyweight. 
and mm-hmm. I was I was still a middleweight. And I fought at East Lyme, Connecticut, um, in the middleweight division. Of course, I lost. And then uh, in forms, I beat my own instructor um, at that time, a guy named Bob Deuce, um, and uh, that was pretty cool. And then I don't know why he didn't stay to watch me fight. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> sorry, Bob. Um, so, but the, uh, I didn't know what an open division was, but apparently the open division, it doesn't matter what weight class you are. And that's where all the guys from the Atlantic karate team. And I guess now it's the John Paul Mitchell team. But back then it was the Atlantic guys and it was Steve nasty Anderson and, uh, and Billy blanks. So mm-hmm. I ended up fighting Billy blanks. Now I didn't know who these guys were back then, but there was, there was Ed Parker was there right at ringside. And so was Pokey Hill. And, uh, just, it was kind of a who's who of martial arts people. And, uh, now you know anything about weight sure, you know, that tip of the toe front kick that we use is kind of a, a lethal tool. And, um, it's the fastest kick in self-defense, the fastest kick in martial arts is that, that, uh, that, that big, big toe kick. Anyway, so, so it would move off the line and pow, I hit him with that front kick just about belt level. Boom, he'd go down, neutral corner. <laughs> he would come again, bam. Down he'd go, neutral corner. <laughs> so if I'd score at any point, I'm getting pissed. <laughs> well, next time I kick him even harder. <laughs> Man, they would give me the points, and uh, and, and uh, he gives me a warning. He's going to disqualify me for excessive contact. I go, listen, this guy's running into the kick, and he, he didn't want to hear it because you know obviously the guys on the teams are their bread and butter. So right. uh, he comes off the line with one of those little flipping back fist things. And uh, over my head. And, I mean, I had the tape. I had this tape on VHSC. You know those little VHS things? Yep, the day yep. Before? My mother threw it out. I oh. kept this on my damn website. Okay, so anyway, long story short, Billy Blanks quit. So, yeah, how about that? We made Billy Blanks quit. So, <laughs> <that would be. laughs> so, <laughs> so, I love that. Anyway, I got that in. Sorry, Billy. <laughs> Uh, you know what the greatest thing was? Uh, my friend was for a, uh, a, a martial arts supply company. Um, and I guess, I don't know how she got a hold of him, but before Billy went bankrupt on the, I don't know what happened with Tybo, but before he lost all his dough to the, to the he had ordered a bunch of the Tybo wrist wraps for the, the yep. <laughs> I have two pair of Tybo wrist wraps now. <laughs> so if I wear them at a seminar, I get to tell the story. Oh, yeah. Like, it reminds me, you know. <laughs> well, I hope you have a photo of you wearing those and, and that you could send that to us. So we could put that up in the show notes as well. Because that's the fun kind of stuff we like to put over there on the show yeah. notes as well. That's, you know, um, I've heard a lot of great Billy Blank stories. This is by far the best one. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. He's flying to Connecticut. <laughs> I can see it. I can totally see all of this this happening. It's oh, very yeah. vivid. It was magical. And you know what's really funny is Nasty Anderson back then when he was fighting was uh, he was a big man, and I was not yet big. I was still a middleweight. Um, and I it would have been amazing to fight him. Later on, I went to one of his classes in uh, at Karate College, and then I saw him at Deleuze's memorial um, when we went to the funeral, and he had lost like had to lose sixty pounds. So he was not what he was, you know, the day I saw him. And um, sure. I didn't really pay attention to those guys at event, events because they always got buys. You know, they didn't have to fight in the preliminaries. And I'm sitting here at Gladiator School fighting like six guys. So <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, yeah, so the, the long story short of this thing, it wasn't supposed to end with Billy. It, um, this guy, uh, David Sinopoli, he's a bum. I use a Kempo style that he trains with Walt Lysak out of Ludlow now in um, at Cento, uh, the the reality martial arts stuff. So he um, uh, he said to me at the tournament, uh, that I, I go, and we're at Pittsfield High School, and again one of the referees comes up to me, he goes, listen, you're going to have to really hit him because they're not looking at the way Taru guys, they're looking at the you know the other guys. So apparently the refereeing wasn't too good there, and. Uh, <laughs> So I said, okay. <laughs> so I clocked the guy, and then I clocked him again. And then um, and then the third time, he disqualified me. So, uh, <laughs> but the guy said to me, uh, that same guy came up to me, and he said, you know, 
if you were in the heavyweight division, <laughs> and I said, I'm, and I'm like 170. So I'm thinking, man, I got to go up. So <laughs> my buddy Dave Sinopoli says, uh, says, well, you know, we're going to go, you know, if you eat like six meals a day and you lift like four times a week. And I was going, okay, well, it's so different than I'm lifting now. And he says, oh, you got to lift heavy. So I started doing that. So I lifted my way to heavyweight. But now I didn't lose anymore. It was pretty cool. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's neat. So you've trained with a ton of people, and we've heard some great names here. But if you could train with somebody that you haven't, live or dead, who would that be and why? Uh, I have it. Like, what, would you, what would you say? I guess, you know what? It, it would be a toss-up. I would want to train with either Kambu and Weichi, or I would want to train with... Uh, with Bruce Lee. I think it'd be Bruce Lee because Joe was pretty impressed with Bruce Lee. I mean, he was a good coach, not a fighter, but a good coach. So I think, uh, I think that would probably be it because I would want to see the, because they'll look in Joe's eyes when you talk about how they would do drills. And, and, uh, when Linda, Linda Lee, um, Bruce's wife said that, uh, that Joe and, uh, and Bruce were kindred spirits. So if I hadn't worked, worked with Bruce, that would have, to, that would make sense to me that I would want to train with him. Hmm. Oh, neat. And tell us a little bit about your your other choice. Say it again. Your other choice. My other your choice. Kanbo yeah. Weichi was the founder of Weichi Karate. Um, he was the the, the father of Kanbo Weichi, and um, I mean, he died in the early, uh, um, the early the like nineteen forties, and um, I uh, when they did Weichi back then, it was different than. But they changed it. They kind of defanged the way to where they turned around and had to make it safer. Like they took all, mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff from the Bubishi, which was actively taught um, under Kamu, which it was not, it was changed by, uh, by some of the, the senior masters there. So, because it was too dangerous. Even in the, even in the 80s, I remember they have a, 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 a two person set called Don Kumite. The original Don Kumite had a spinning back kick in it. In the 80s, they took it out. Um, you know, I mean, I saw pictures of these guys uh, wearing black geese. So I know on days when they weren't teaching that they were doing jujitsu. And the thing is, is none of this stuff was taught. I didn't even learn how to fall at the karate school. When UFC came out, I went to uh, the Dalton Judo Club, and Harry Chandler, uh, great coach, was the judo teacher. Of course, you can never get ranked in judo unless you go to tournaments, and I couldn't go to tournaments because I had to fight on Saturday and Sunday. So I, I, I went to judo for three years, four years, and did everything, but I was always a white belt. <laughs> but, you know, I guess you got to go to tournaments to get promoted. But, uh, so yeah, I, I learned to follow judo at the judo school, and then Mike Di Pasquale has a, has a way of reinforcing your falling ability by throwing you harder and higher and farther. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for Harry Chandler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that you've been an actor. Oh, yeah. I know you've got some movies, and we're, we're going to end up linking to some of them, and, and I want you to talk about them in a moment. But do you have any favorites? Are there any martial arts films that you really love, whether or not you've been in them? Um, I don't know. I think from from the martial arts guys, I like. I, I like Jason Stratham. I like that guy a lot. Like I went back to his old stuff, the UK stuff, yeah. and he's I, I like him. Um, let's see, this Tony Jai. I've been watching. I watched some of his yeah. stuff, and then um, I don't know John Wu as a director has a way of taking these people that I don't know and turn them into superstar martial artists on the street. Because I'll turn around and watch, watch a movie with somebody I never heard of and go, wow. And, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a John Woo movie, so go figure. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a Tony Jai and uh, <laughs> I think Jason Stratham are two of my more favorite ones. Any movies in particular from either of them that, that jump out at you? Nah, no. No? No, uh, because I mean, when I had my I had my surgery, I I was uh, kind of bedridden for like a month, and I mm. I went and bought a my daughter and I went to Best Buy 
and we turned around and bought a bunch of Blu-rays. And I, I mean, I'm sure I have the title in my drawer. <laughs> and I think I was, I think there's a stack of 20 of them in there. And I just went through and that, that's how I spent my 30 days doing that and watching Joe Lewis training videos. Right. So you mentioned one book, but are there any other martial arts books that you think highly of? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. In my book, in my bag, in the trunk, there is, it's, it's funny you should say this. <laughs> um, but I think one of, the, one of the more significant ones was, was uh, his 40 Years and Four Steps to China by Jim, Jim Hulse which is a pretty amazing book. And um, well, obviously, Bubiji, I keep that in the bag. Mm-hmm. There's there's a book that Danny Drain gave me about, uh, that, that he did, about recovering from uh, martial arts injuries, training methods for recovery. Oh. I don't know the title of it. It, and it, and it. it, in fact, is not in the bag that I carry around, but that is a, uh, that's a that's a pretty significant book. So if somebody's injury prone or older, that would be a good book for them to have. Um, yeah, if you could get me the information on that, that would be great. Yeah, I'll do it. When I go back to my house, I'll turn around, and take a picture of it, and send it to your perfect. Send it to your perfect. phone. Um, awesome. That one, yeah. Joe Lewis before he died wrote a a, a manual, uh, uh, which is I remember when I first read his his manual, uh, it. Uh, I was, let's see, it, 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 there's so much depth to it that I would read a page and stop and then pick it up again later. That's how good it was. Like that. Like you want to think about it for, for you know? Um, so, yeah, that, that man, the Joe Lewis manual is, uh, is huge. That's always in my bag. And then the Bugishi, um so George Madison had one called the uh, Black Belt Test Guide, which is good. And then there's um oh oh here's one for you. This is an old one, but this is a, this is a classic. It's the uh, Jack Dempsey has a book. I think it's uh, it's called Aggressive Defense or something like that. I learned a lot of stuff out of that book. And then yeah, so that's that, and I got it off Amazon, so you can get that book. Um, okay, that's a real good one. That's one of the most significant ones I think on striking as far as and, and tactics with that Jack Dempsey book. And then there's a uh, Rory Miller's stuff is always good. I don't know if you've read any of Rory Miller's books. No, no I haven't. Yeah, um, uh, Meditations on violence. And he's just uh, a real good guy to work with too. Real good guy. Matter of fact, what did he say to me? He goes, he goes, Oh, we're talking about the inner thug. He, he just happened to walk into the room. <laughs> Buckman doesn't have it in her thug. He just wears it on his sleeve. <laughs> and it's funny because he, last year he was sending me pictures from all different continents wearing my t-shirts, wearing Pierce gear. So, <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, that was very cool. He goes, your shirt's been on five continents. I need another one. But I missed nice. him this summer. He's, yeah, he's a great guy. He comes to New England. He's out of, I think he's out of Seattle or California or something. But he um, uh, he he, has, he writes good stuff, and it's uh, it's an easy read, and you also uh, it's, you turn around and you can apply it pretty quickly. Um, okay. Now, success books. Obviously, I have to. I'm, I'm still pretty high on that Buzz Durkin book. I have to tell you that that uh, martial arts success books. I never read one before because I'm you know. <laughs> I remember getting all those those videotapes in the mail from the the electronic billing companies that would tell you how to how to do an appointment and enter, you know, a, a guest interview and a tour mm-hmm. of the dojo. And I was bored to tears by those people because I was a professional salesperson. They were obviously martial arts people trying to sell. Whereas, right. whereas Buzz is a, like, he is just a genuine nice guy with razor sharp business sense. I was impressed by him when I first met him when I was 16 and I, didn't have a school, but knew I wanted to have one. And I went to uh, a seminar that he taught on, you know, how to run a successful school. And I was just at 16, you would think you couldn't sit through something like that for an hour when you're at a martial arts camp, but this was great. And the stuff he handed out 
and sure enough, within two years, I had I was a partner in a school, and and we we employed the things that he said at that meeting. I pulled out the old binder that he gave us. <laughs> so that's oh, a good book too. Oh, great! You're you're quite the sponge, I guess is the best word. You 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 certainly are always looking for more pieces to add. Oh yeah. And and I really respect that. It's something that I try to do myself, but I, I am not as good of it at it as you. Certainly so. Um, yeah, cool. W- we have some time, so I'd like to go back and see if you'd be willing to share that Joe Lewis story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is pretty good. So, <laughs> so I had just moved to uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I was running the juice bar. I wasn't running the juice bar at the Gold's Gym yet. I was looking for a job and because uh, I wanted to join a gym. And uh, so I worked for one of those labor-ready companies, you know, where they pay you five bucks an hour. My job for them was digging. There had just been a huge rain, and all the foundations they had built in this housing development were full of mud. So they had mm. me and a bunch of, bunch of uh, Mexican laborers dig, <laughs> digging mud. <laughs> out of these concrete foundations. So mm. with my first check, I turn around and uh, I went to Gold's Gym. And uh, I met a kid named Drew. And of course, we hit it off right away because he was training for his first kickboxing fight. And uh, so I signed up. And then I ended up, uh, within a month, I think I was working there. And then uh, he asked me if I would train him for his, his, his first kickboxing fight. So I proceeded to train him, and, um, of course, I'm working mitts and the whole thing, and, uh, you know, then I'm running him through workouts, and this goes on and on, and then we go to the event, and <laughs> this is funny. It's, it's at the Double Door in Lake Norman, uh, North, North Carolina, and it was a, mm-hmm. a basically a bar. And... Uh, <laughs> You can't. You make sure you don't jump up too high because your head will hit the light and you'll burn yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited. It's a great venue. There's some cool people there. They got the bud. Now back then, remember they had the the Budweiser frogs and they had the yep. the little lizards and stuff. So when they when you bought a beer, they would come with the rubber uh, gecko stuck to the bottle. So that was cool. <laughs> and the Copenhagen girls were there. And I mean, this is a real live venue. WCK Kickbox. It was fun. So, well, uh, anyway, this is his first fight. He gets up there, and um, he's going to fight this giant guy named Tice Stevens. Now, that was okay. He saw the guy, and he wasn't really that freaked out, except what freaked him out, I think, was what came in front of Tice Stevens. There was <laughs> three world champions were his coaches. There was oh. Ronnie Copeland, Kevin Hurricane Hudson, and uh, – Damn, what was that little guy's name? Bob, uh, I never remember that kid's name. Anyway, uh, the three guys, all with their belts over their head and the whole thing. But, I, I mean, I was confident. I knew what I was doing coaching him, so I figured we're all set. Well, he turns to me in the corner and goes, I can't do this. And I was like, what? He goes, I, I can't do it. So... <laughs> I go to the promoter. I go, listen, this kid, he, he's backing out. He's scared to death. So <laughs> I don't remember if they put another fight on or how it went. But the promoter said, well, you're a Joe Lewis black belt. Why don't you fight this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I'm an idiot. I always have gear in the car. <laughs> I always have two sets just in case the other person tries to make an excuse why they don't want to spot. I even keep an extra mouth guard in there just in case. So... <laughs> So I got gear in the car, and I go, oh, damn it, here we go. Now, keep in mind that I had been weight training and running and not really martial arts training at all. I've been coaching him for a couple months. So with no sparring, no nothing, I, uh, and I'm amped up. I've been back then to, 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 keep, to maintain weight, you'd take aspirin, ephedrine, and caffeine. Well, you're only about two months of ephedrine, and all of a sudden your legs don't work. Mm. So I did a spectacular warm up, <laughs> and I'm hooking kicks, and I'm I'm doing my best Bill Wallace stuff because back then I was fully capable of all that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I got in the ring, 
that boy Tice, he hit me square in the face. I went back, and, uh, not rocked back, but um, he actually moved my entire body with a punch. Like, I'm standing in position, and bam, he hits me, and I went, whoop, back. And <laughs> the girl I was dating at the time turned around later and told me, she goes, I'd never seen anyone move you before. And personally, I don't really remember that shot. I'm telling you about it because she told me about it. But that's how it starts. And then I go on autopilot at that point. You get a good shot, and I'm on autopilot. Sorry. And uh, and he had a beautiful round kick like uh, like his teachers, Ronnie Copeland and Kevin Hudson, where they can turn around and they'll break in your mouth guard for you. They just lift that knee up and pop mm. that shin and pop you right in the neck. Well, this kid's... He, he threw one and I caught it on the, on the glove. So I just wanted to shut that kick down. So of course I'm using my, my tried and true front kick and just kicking him and kicking him just above the hip. So he doesn't want to kick anymore. <laughs> anyway, it, it goes on and on. And after the second round, he says to me, um, no, you missed your minimum kicks in the last round. I said, what? He goes, you didn't get your minimum kicks in. He goes, if you miss them this round, he goes, uh, he goes, that's it. So I turn around and I fight the next round and I'm trying to kick more, but obviously the ephedrine is eating my legs. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I, I fire a kick at the bell and they don't count it. So they disqualify me. Mm. So, so it's my one loss. And I turn around. This is a great story because I didn't know that Kevin Hudson was a, a Joe's black belt, nor did I know that. Ronnie Copeland was, but now I'm determined. I don't know about you, but if I fail or I lose, I'm coming. Watch out. So I turn around and, um, I went to Greer where Kevin Hudson's gym was and offered to teach kickboxing fitness for him in exchange for him and Ronnie training me. And those guys, <laughs> those guys, one would be in the corner, the other would be in the ring with me. And, you know, you're sitting here blocking kicks with your mouth guard. And, um, <laughs> the other one's talking to you from the corner. So then they'd switch. So that was a great training experience. And then, of course, we were near Joe Lewis because he was living in Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, we go to we go to uh, Pinehurst to introduce kickbox fitness to uh, Club Corps of America. And he turns to these guys and, and he says, I think it was Randy Ballard. He says, they're all going to go to lunch. And he goes, no, Buckley, you got to stay here. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, Randy, Randy. Can you make them look like us? I mean, move like. <laughs> they didn't want me in the demo because he said I move like a constipated duck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so much for Sanchez. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that was a, that was a great story. They had, uh, and and the thing it was funny because we we're at that club court thing and we stayed at a. I think it used to be, a stable, right? I mean, a giant stable. It was nice, modern and stuff. And Joe was in the next room. And, of course, Joe's a practical joker, so there's all kind of stuff going on in there. You, <laughs> it's, uh, but that, that's, the rest of that story is for another day. <laughs> Perfect. And we'll have to have you on again at some point in the future, and we'll do episode two with you, and we can there you go. the second half. All right. So... You know, I know you're teaching now and you're and you're training, but what's keeping you going? You have some goals, some things you're working towards. Well, I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to do this school up here and have a place where if you know people come to the Northeast and they want to, you know, do some cross training and, and come up and play, that I would have a good student base that would carry on what I had learned for me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, that maybe this could be you know how it ends for me that I could turn around and and just retire having a school you know and of course it's slow going but I've been with uh, I've been with Buzz's help we've built it up and uh, we got a lot of I've got a lot of great students that um, that are just I mean they're phenomenal martial artists and the thing is they're good in all the ranges. We got, mm. you know, they're they're kicking like Bill, they're punching like Joe, they're they're grappling like Mike D, and finishing like Kenzo. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> that would be a super martial artist right there. I would yeah. not step into the ring with anybody that had 
I, two of those. I, I feel like I, I feel like I should buy them capes. Anyway, yeah, they look really good. I want to. I just want to go be able to go to an event and have five or six of my people there, you know, wearing the fierce gear, and people say, "Man, those people are good." And that's just so that they, you know, because it's funny because the whole fears limited thing um, it, is what it is. It's just a morph of the styles that I learned. And the, the, the thing is, is when they see these guys perform or when they see them spar, or they see their martial arts, it, what it does is it, it's empowering to me because number one, it means, Hey, you got it. And you were able to teach it. Cause that's one thing. Not all of us are going to be world champions. We're not all going to be fighters, but if we leave this with a fighter's heart, that's all we can ask for. And to change one student's life, I mean, that's a real, that's a big thing. And I'm watching, I'm changing lives every night at the school. So we're having a great time. Um, in the, uh, and we, and we're in Dover, New Hampshire. So it's like a, it's kind of a hall for me, but um, it's more of a population center than where I live in Wells, Maine. But uh, it, sure. that's good. And the seminar stuff is going real good. That's, Every time, like twice a year, I'll turn around and make a trip um, south. And I have five, five or six schools that consistently are emailing or calling and saying, hey, will you come back and do a seminar? Can we work on this next time? And work. So it, it's cool to be able to you know, do some distance teaching, too. We're upgrading the website so that these guys can you know, see what we're doing on a week-to-week basis. But to go in there and touch down in somebody else's school and, and share stuff and have them be really receptive and excited. It was funny. My, my buddy, Dennis Campo down in, uh, uh, Pelham, New York. He, uh, he goes, you know, Buckland, when you come in and he goes, I get students I haven't seen in a year showing up. He goes, I don't know what's going on. But yeah, it was great. I went on my way to karate college and, uh, I stopped off at like four or five of these little schools and we had groups of like 25, 30 people. It was fantastic. So cool. I'm kind of living the dream with that stuff. And then I'm doing some movies. So I'm, um, I think the next thing is a Ben Affleck movie. Uh, so who knows? I guess I get to play Batman. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I, nice. it, it, this is what I'm doing. You know, This is great. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you, if they're interested in bringing you in to their school for a seminar or they're, they're passing through the Northeast and they want to drop into your school, or, or something, you know, how would they get a hold of you? Is the website the best? Or? They could do the website and call the cell phone. It's, uh, okay. yeah, the cell phone's 207 450 5458. And then it's uh, fearslimited.com is the website. Um, it's actually, we're, we're going through some, some real big, real big changes in there and doing a lot of filming. So there's a lot of online training that's, uh, that they'll start popping up on there now because we're actively working on it. Um, oh, great. Yep, and we're we're looking to recruit some trainers. So if somebody's out there and they're like minded, and we run into you, um, we'd love to come to your location and turn around and see if we can't share some stuff. Awesome, I think that's fantastic. And of course, you know we'll, we'll have the website linked over there, and, and put your cell phone number out there too for for people to get a hold of you. And you know, if nothing else, if someone's listening and they don't train martial arts, you can probably come in and do some stand up comedy. <laughs> well, it's funny. <laughs> It's funny they got me uh, talking, speaking at a school uh, down in Virginia. That's uh, that's one of the things that's going on in this next trip. So I guess oh, I'm branching. Cool. I'm branching out. I'm a public speaker. You're you're an entertainer and educator now. There you go. You transcended just the martial arts realm, <laughs> and, and isn't that the dream? Because that's where the money is. Is outside of the martial arts. That's right. <laughs> well. Let's end on a on a high note here. Do you have any advice for the people that are listening? Um, okay, yeah, this is uh, one of the one of the last things that uh, Joe has ever told me, and it is probably the most significant thing that anyone ever anyone ever said to me. Um, what in his just his words were: "Innovate, don't imitate." And a lot of what we would do coming up with Joe going to seminars or even with anybody with all the different styles is you would try to imitate the instructor rather than from the very beginning, 
turn around and, and assimilate what they're they're giving you and make it your own. And mm-hmm. Dennis Knackard told me something that Joe never would say. <laughs> and Dennis said to me, um, I, he, he, he just gutted me with, uh, he says, wow, he goes, you play like a teacher. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, all the movements are perfect. And this, he goes, that's, he goes, I, he, he goes, I need you to, uh, I need you to unlearn some of that. And he tried, I go, well, and, and so I'm, and he goes, now how about after three hours of training with him, um, in June, he, he says to me, now, is, is this too much? And I said, no, this is great. Keep going. And, and he said, I go, but I don't know how I'm going to you have time to practice this. I'm teaching all the time. And he goes, well, in your workouts, he goes, he goes, you know, work it in and work on it. He goes, It'll, it might take you a year to make these changes that I showed you. And uh, he goes, but the best thing you can do is teach it. I go, what are you talking about? Joe would never let me do that. And he says, yeah, he goes, just take these things I'm giving you right now. Just uh, kind of get an understanding for it. And now go out your next seminar chair. I did that. And I've done that with my yellow belts and the orange belts and the green belts and turn around. And once they learn a skill set, turn around and make them teach it to somebody else. Oh my God, they're so much better. And I'm so much better for having known this. Um, and I'm not like a little Joe Louis soldier where I turn around and I'm imitating Joe's movements. I just took the tactics and strategies and mindset that he taught me and the attitude and turn around and apply it to what is my martial art, regardless of what the tagline is, whether it's way too low or fears limited or, you know, it doesn't make a difference. So innovate, don't imitate. Fabulous advice. And Sensei Buckland, I really appreciate you being here on the show. I've had a great time and laughed a lot. And as I expected, had to mute my microphone quite a bit. <laughs> so <laughs> th- thanks for all the great stuff you shared with us today. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to episode 32 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Sensei Buckland. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our exclusive newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you for two things to help us out, first, please leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcast. If we read your review on the air, just contact us, and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. Second, please spread the word about our show to anyone you think might like it. Don't forget the great stuff we make at Whistlekick. Sparring gear, shirts, pants, and a lot more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.